Hi guys, welcome back to G2 Esports Class Legends. So we're just just um, laughing at the chat reactions after the turn two um, pilot shredder top deck into turn three or turn four turn four emperor top deck, right? Yep, that was glorious. Uh, but in front of us, there will be a ne last quarter final happening, which will be between Gara and Super JJ. The players are almost ready. Super JJ is the only player that is sporting a rogue in this tournament, while Gara is playing a warlock. And he was using a zoo five times yesterday, if I recall correctly, because he yeah. was playing against a hunter and his tech was a Kazan Mystic uh, to battle that kind of matchup, right? And he actually won two games because of that Kazan Mystic. So. Uh, it was an interesting choice, and I'm really curious what is his second deck. Maybe it's better against Rogue, uh, and, and, and because that the second deck, I don't know, will be something based with Weapon Hate, an example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it, we, we don't know, so we'll see uh, how it goes. Yeah, and just one of the interesting things to point out here, as I checked out in the break, we so far have a Priest, a Warrior, and a Druid through to the semi-finals. And since this matchup is Rogue against Warlock, we are guaranteed to have a top four of four different classes from our players. So the variation is at least is working out pretty nicely for this this new format, Lothar. Yep, I think so. I mean, uh, it's a single elimination tournament, so probably would have been different if we would uh, make a Swiss tournament, an example. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, maybe that will be the next thing that we'll do, because I think the format is cool, but it's so hard to enforce the rules of the decklist if you're right. not inviting people, right? Directly. Yeah, it makes sense. We'll see. Um, but yeah, it looks like Gara is going straight to the zoo here, so probably doesn't have a, a like a teched out control warlock with a with a bunch of acidic oozes and stuff that he can use to counter rogue. And it looks like he's just gonna rely on the aggression of his zoo to take it down. But as we said, his tech choice in the previous series of having the, the Kezan Mystic or the, the tech choice that works so well in the previous series when the Kezan Mystic is not gonna have any effect here against Rogue. Yep, and we see the agent on turn two, which will be the perfect answer against the flame imp. Basically, the agent deals three damage to the opponent's face and two damage to the minion. Seems like a good deal for two mana. Certainly does. And Gara, by playing that Nerubian egg, has relinquished all his pressure on the board to this coined out SI agent. He's going to have to play the peddler here if he doesn't immediately pick up an answer. Yeah, so he's going to have to play the peddler and just hope for a power overwhelming, I imagine. And nope. Not well, Bloodsaw Blood Corsair. Right. Yeah, yeah. Bloodsaw Corsair is not that bad. Uh, definitely something that you pick up quite often, uh, more against warriors, just because the the second charge of the death spite is so important to eliminate on your terms rather than theirs. But mm -hmm. also has uh, excellent value against a rogue if they do equip a deadly poison and leave it sitting there on a on a single charge afterwards. And so. it seems like this is the turn when he will actually do that, right? Yep. So it's a good pickup. Wow, this actually matters a lot. Yeah, it certainly does. He may just. Still choose to go for the implosion this turn though, because if he fills his board up with a bunch so. of one, yeah, if he fills his board up with a bunch of one, one, okay, no, 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 all right. Now we drew the power overwhelming. That's not going to happen. But say he didn't draw the power overwhelming. Okay. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have had an answer to that. Um. Oh, okay. Oh, Fine, he's goes it for it anyway. anyway. Wow. Right. Because I think in this situation, that second charge of the dagger is very unlikely to be used. Right. Because what's he going to hit with it? Um, so prep sprint is going to come down, the dagger is going to stay there, and now we have a, a chance to build up the board later on after eliminating the 3-3, and you put yourself in a, in a much more dominating position. So yeah, I'm actually a big fan of the implosion play here. I think it's a strong play. Hmm. Okay. I don't know, I'm just kind of surprised that you play the implosion on 10-4 when you don't have... Like, it's a 33% that you're with, and your yeah. opponent still has the 3-3 on board. When you have a... 100% chance that you will take the, the board control. You have minions, you destroy the weapon with the deadly poison to play around Blade Flurry, and your opponent will have to do something immediately about the board because it puts a 3-2 minion and a 4-4 minion, yeah. and a 1-2, which is not that important, but he needs to do something about the board immediately, right? Agreed. I think the the power overwhelming may have swayed my my line towards the you know the, the power overwhelming blood cell corsair play, but before the power overwhelming was drawn, I think the implosion was a lot better to take the risk of the the thirty three percent because 
all you would have had in play was a 1-2 and a 3-2 against a 3-3. So if your opponent has something as simple as a backstab, you're still just pretty far ahead behind on the board, even after destroying the Deadly Poison. Mm -hmm. Okay. But double backstabs in the hand, a fan of knives, to bet for, for, uh, for JD that he doesn't have the second prep, because that would be perfect this turn. Yeah, the can huge. But you can still kill the um, knife juggler and the Nerubian spider. Yep. On the back of two backstabs and the agent. Yeah, it's definitely the play that jumps out to me here. And then you you leave the rest of the minions alive. If you know they can choose to trade if they want, but if they don't, then you have the fan of knives, which can tidy most of it up afterwards. Um, so yeah, this this line looks pretty solid. But it looks like. JJ is going to leave up the 4-4 here, possibly just SIing down the 1-2 and then daggering one of the 1-1s. One and no, he's going to go for the fan instead. Okay, so he's just going to leave... No? All right. He's sapping. He's again okay. sapping the 4-4. Four four. Hmm. So he still has the option of backstabbing and uh, dealing the 2 damage to the Nurban Spider next turn. Yes. That's the logic. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what was going to happen. Yeah, well... Now this turn is uh, getting a little bit awkward. There is many, many decisions to be made here as to whether or not it's correct to tap. Obviously, tapping with a Doom Guard in your hand is usually not ideal because you're going to end up discarding those cards anyway most of the time. Um, but also, he has Doom Guard and Malganis in the same hand. So the card that you really want to see in that situation is Void Caller because that's the only way you're going to really get value out of those two cards, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. both of those cards, in any time in the near future. Um, so that incentivizes him to tap. Um, yep. But there's also the merit he could just decide that he's put enough pressure on early, seeing the rogue at 16 health. He might even decide to go down the line where he just slams the Doom Guard this turn alongside the Void Walker and just starts dealing damage. To be honest, I like that. Yeah. I like the Doom Guard this turn. And you want to play the Doom Guard before you play the Void Walker? To have a chance of still having the Nerubian Spider or the Malganus? Hmm, okay. I kind of like having the Void Walker as a taunt here. It protects the 1-1 the one -one from removal. You've already seen a fan of knives being used. It protect, protects, like, say, hitting the Doom Guard and Blade Flurrying, something like that. So having the 1-3 taunt in play here is a, is a pretty useful tool. And you're still several turns away from playing Malganis. And by, by making this play, your plan is probably just to end the game before you get to the Malganis turn anyway. How much damage is that? Well, that fits the mana curve. Does yeah. So I it's imagine... six damage, and your opponent is is forced to use heal if he has it. Yeah, I think the trade on the three three might just be too good here though. If you abusive on the left hand side onto the one one, trade the one mm -hmm. one into the three three, and then just Argus the two remaining minions. I think that might be too appealing to pass up. But Gara may decide that he's all in on the face play here. Isn't he better to, to set up a level of a top deck next turn? It might well be. I mean, there's a there's a lot of options that this plays into here. Um, you've already seen one Deadly Poison used, but you haven't seen a Blade Flurry, and your board would be very, very exposed to Blade Flurry, but you are pushing a ton of damage. But if your board is cleared, your only um, your only reach is a Doom Guard or a, a Soul Fire from Dark Peddler. So it's very limited options if you do sacrifice your whole board. Still two outs. It is, two, it is yeah. Well, it's it's one and a bit out, right? Like, <laughs> Pedler isn't exactly a clean out, but yeah, yeah you are putting your opponent to four. Oh, it's gonna oh. take the value trade instead. That's really interesting. Value trade, yeah, because now the, the hmm, the blade flurry now just with the with the azure drake would be kind of devastating, right? Hmm. Okay. Let me go heal bot though. It goes to 16, he's facing down. It goes to 14, he's facing down 6 damage on the board, so he's functionally at 8. Um, so yeah, it's kind of unlikely that he would die here. Oh, look at that. Draws, but that is pretty solid. Oh, Void caller, go face. Void caller, go face seems legit. Yep. He already used, I mean, he. Super JJ already used an eviscer double eviscerates. One, no, 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 double backsteps, one of his raid, one fan of knives, one deadly poison, one deadly poison and no blade flurries. And a sap. And a sap, yes, good point. So, most likely, the Doomguard, even if the Vodka will get killed, the Doomguard will not be removed from the board. Yeah. 
And the sap is actually really crucial because the sap on the void caller would be the one thing that you're scared of. You know, sap on that and blade flurry to clear the rest of your board would be the the, the nightmare. So the fact that one sap is already gone. I think we just have to end up with the void caller face play here. You have plenty of health. You're not definitely not too worried about dying on the backswing. Whoa! He's gonna trade. Just play the doom guard. Okay, I'm surprised. I'm surprised too. Um, because that doesn't set up lethal next turn. I mean, it does in theory. You have seven damage on the board. That's seven health. But that's yeah, it's not gonna happen. Right. I know. <laughs> you, you think the two two is gonna die for sure. So you are at least relying on drawing damage from your deck to even threaten lethal. Whereas the the void caller play just very very consistently threatens lethal. Oh, so. An interesting line, but it looks like he may get rewarded here because although we're saying he needs to draw damage, it is only two damage, which Zoo draws pretty consistently. There's one Abusive Sergeant, one PO, uh, one Peddler into Abusive Sergeant, or... That's it. Uh, or PO. Yep. Argent Squad is not it. M Gang yeah, boss. boss is not it. Neither. So he's going to give his opponent another turn, and now suddenly that Tinker's Oil Blade Flurry can definitely make some things happen here. Is it that's lethal? That's lethal, right? Uh, because it's uh, 4, four five, 5, 9... 16? Oh, one off. I think so. Hmm. 4 from I'm... the Drake, 1 from the Dagger. And... and then Blade Flurry adds plus 1. Yeah. My god. Trades it. Trade it. <laughs> <laughs> So you'd have a four damage dagger that'd be. Uh, How do you win now? How do you win now when your opponent is at seven and you have no charges left? I don't know. It's difficult. Maybe there is another charger in the deck. There has been a, a little. Leroy bit. Jenkins. I'm not. Yeah, I mean that has happened. Like uh, Doom Guards and Leroy in the same deck is rare, but there is a deck going around that has cut the Doom Guards in favor of Leroy Jenkins, which is. A little bit strange in my view, but it's out there, so there may be the possibility of an extra charger in this deck, but from this position, it does seem like Gara has just slipped the initiative a little bit here in terms of being able to make the push for lethal, and he's going to lose his board right now to this Blade Flurry. He's going to get to hold on to his 1-1 Argent Squire, but... Um... And a 1-1 Demon. Oh, well, that's very true. So we're looking at Power Overwhelming plus something being lethal. Yo, that's six damage! Power Overwhelming plus any other buff would have been lethal there. Abusive Sergeant, Defender of Argus, Direwolf Alpha, any of the above would have been lethal. Playing to save bites him back. Mm, so close. Hmm. Well, now you can't do anything. You can only play defensively, and that puts you away from the win anyway, unless, as you said, there's another charger in the deck. I think... Uh, so Gara was looking at implosioning the Violet Teacher. I think if you're going to have any chance of winning this game, you need to do it the other way around. You need to power overwhelming into the Violet Teacher and then uh, implosion one of the 1-1s one and try and roll as high as possible to have a threat on board. Because you've already seen a bunch of AoEs used. So if you can get you know four or five tokens on the board, then that might not be enough to take it out. Yeah, so he's going to go to the implosion on a token here. Does roll four, so the power overwhelming may go face, may trade. Both are valid here. Looks like it's a trade, so he's going to focus on the board. Wow, the extra trade does uh, scare me a little bit there, though. Don't really see what that plays around in this situation. Yeah, I mean, either. Uh, Is there another... Um... Oh, no, I guess it plays... He's only at seven, so I guess it plays around Eviscerate. But... Okay, yeah. Let's... Yeah. Well, the four impl uh, the four damage implosion changes the whole dynamic the dynamic of the game because now now JJ is staring actually at a problem. Yep. He can only clear one of the minions without taking damage, so another PO or soul fire is lethal. So is it better to go for the sprint first? He's just going to go for the pressure play with the lower third bow and hope that the damage isn't drawn. It's going to need to be power overwhelming again or back-to-back -back two damage cards. Uh, Abusive Sergeant plus Argus, something like that. 
Uh, he has two draws for it. He hasn't taken away the tap as an option. Im game boss is a whiff. Needs PO. No. Oh, and two damage of lethal. That's about it. I think he's been one or two damage off lethal for three turns now. Mm -hmm. Um, which yeah, there there were maybe one or two questionable decisions in the in the mid game turns of how he decided to. It wasn't that he wasn't being aggressive; he was being aggressive. Well, he um, was very aggressive with the Doom Guards. Right. And I liked that. That yeah. he was aggressive with the Doom Guards. But when he was aggressive with the Doom Guards, I thought he would be aggressive with his whole board. Because that exactly. goes in the theme, right? Yeah. What do you want to do? What's your strategy uh, in that situation? When he traded, he go, he went for the value trades in, instead, even. Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, definitely the one turn that stands out to me is the turn where he decided to just play the second Doom Guard when he could have just aggressively hit face with his existing board and then played the Void Caller. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about, like, how does this possibly get cleared? And, you know, it's, it's involving, like, Sap plus Blade Flurry and already one Sap had been used, so... And one uh, of was used, double backs up the Deadly used. Poison was already used, yeah. So it seems like that was a more consistent line just to build the stickier board and have the Doom Guard for, for backup burst afterwards. Um, but Gara took the line that he took. It didn't quite work out for him, but he was just a one or two damage off lethal for several turns. But mm -hmm. JJ's Rogue is going to continue to perform well for him in this tournament. And uh, Gara is going to have to find another way through this, sticking with the same deck. Uh, doesn't feel like his other deck is more favorable against Rogue. No great surprise, because uh, we talked about this yesterday. Doesn't We don't know what JJ's other Rogue deck is. I think this is the same deck he's played the whole way through. He's been um, Mill Rogue. Right, but unless it's Mill Rogue, you kind of expect both Rogues to be kind of similar, right? Like a, uh, an Oil Rogue and a Miracle Rogue. Pretty similar strategies overall. So you'll kind of feel like you know what your matchups are going in and you'll pick your best deck. So it seems unlikely that after you lose that you'll switch because you'll probably have had the full information in the first place. Yep. Now it's an interesting choice for, for Super JJ because he's missing on the coin. Yep. And he's missing on the prep to take the value from the agent. He kept the Eviscerate, which I like because it's an, it's an answer to a early... Um, Nav Juggler, if needed. Hmm. Is, but, uh, Voidwalker comes down here. Decent minion to have on turn one in this matchup because it does protect a lot of things from, from the dagger getting through to them. Um, but he's going to try and ramp up the aggression fairly quickly here. Uh, Dark Peddler or Nerubian Egg or Coin um, into Gang Boss are his options this turn. Uh, last time he played the egg on turn two and was kind of punished a little bit by losing the initiative immediately to an SI agent. Well, he didn't use the PO back then, right? Yeah. To gain the initiative back. Right. that was the option. Yeah. This then seems like the peddler is probably the best option. Same as last time. Looks like he's favoring getting that egg down first. He has the abusive sergeant in hand plus the it's peddler. In I would really be interested of what is Gara thinking by playing the egg, the same as the, the last game, because mm. he has the option to bot the egg, right? The next turn, the upcoming turn. So it seems yes. like it's the it's the choice that he wants to do. That's the reason why he's playing the egg, but at the same time he's not yeah, using that. That turn. so he's playing like around AOE, mm. but when you want to play AOE, then you play the egg last. You build first the board presence. And right. then you play the egg to play around the AoE. Play the egg immediately, like on the turn you expect the AoE to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is kind of hard to plan against a rogue when does preparation, right? But uh, um, seems like, still like like the usual way you play. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I don't really see any value here in anything except the Flame Imp. There is, of course, always the Reliquary Seeker Dream. It comes up a lot. You always have to make this decision of like, ah, how likely is this? But looking at your hand, you have like an Imp Gang boss and a Creeper. Like, is that good enough to think that you're going to ever have a full board against Rogue? Probably not. Um, whoa, he takes the Goldshire Footman in the end. Took well, Goldshire it's a small Voidwalker. It a looks like Life Coach. Has some value. <laughs> oh my god, cannot unsee Lothar. <laughs> Broken that card for me now. All those times in the meta where people play Goldshire Footman against me, I'm now just going to immediately burst out laughing. I just wanted to say that following the logic of what was Gara doing in the past, 
I want to say that we will use the Abduce of Session on the Voidwalker to trade with the agent and, and save the egg. But this time he's not doing it. Nope. And Blood Mage comes down here just to combo the Eviscerate. Spell damage isn't relevant, but helps him just to keep a handle on this board for now. Needs to deal with that 4 4 before it starts dealing too much damage. I like it because then you have an option to dagger the remains of the peddler, right? It's 2 1. Yep. Of course, unless there will be a taunt. And he doesn't know that there's a footman and a void walker in his opponent's hand, which can be played alongside an immigrant boss, which I feel is like the best turn unless there will be a void walker next turn drawn from the deck. Right. I was going to say, I really like uh, JJ's demeanor in this matchup. He's sort of in between turns, he's just kind of. Uh... Like in going into himself, just making sure he's uh, he's nice and relaxed, and you can see when he gets to his turn, he immediately like explodes into action and knows exactly what he wants to be doing. So, he's uh, he's obviously very comfortable in this matchup. He looks very calm in the situation, and uh, he definitely knows the the plays that he's looking to make when it comes to his turn. Him gang boss gonna come down here. Very irritating minion for Rogue to deal with generally, especially after one. Um, this rate has already been used, and there we go. There is the value in that uh, life coach footman coming down, <laughs> protecting the 2 1 from the dagger removal. Huh. That's a sap. That's nice. You can play a 4 4 minion on board. But probably what you want to do is to get the Azure Drake on board um, and fish for a, for a preparation. Because you want to get value from the Blade Flurry with the second Azure Drake. Maybe play um, the Edwin van Cleef as a six six eight eight. You don't, you are not fearing. Uh, you're not intimidated by the fact that most of the people here are playing the big game hunter, right? It's not the case. Uh, it shouldn't be the case with Gara when he already plays a Castle Mystic. He can't really fill his zoo deck with con uh, like conditional minions. Right, there's a lot of cards that would tie together this hand really nicely, not just the, the prep that you talked about, but also just some sort of weapon buff for those two blade flurries would be awesome, so getting the Drake down here for sure seems like a good play, just to cycle through his deck a little bit quicker. And now with the Violet Teacher in hand, the, the prep does start to look uh, pretty extraordinary if he's able to pick one up. Hmm. It might well. just be lower theb time. A lot Both. of plays around the Azure Drake. It does, yeah. I mean, he doesn't have an efficient way to trade into that Azure Drake. It's kind of the situation we saw before with the um, Emperor Thorasan turn in the AKA Wonder game, where you don't really want to give this minion Wind Fury by trading into it with multiple minions, but mm -hmm. because it's an Azure Drake, you kind of have to respect it. So Lotheb is the only real way that you can play around that without having to give it a bunch of value by trading in. Huh. I feel like Lotep is the best play here. Otherwise, you're being kind of on a mercy of your opponent, having the board clears. Yeah, agreed. Looks like he's going to coin out the Void Walker here as well. But um, obviously, Lotep against Rogue is frustrating. Always, you almost always have a pile of spells in your hand that you want to play. But at least from Super JJ's side, he does have something to do this turn, even if it does mean he's going to take a lot of pressure coming back the other way. At least he does have that second Drake to develop if he wants to, or the Violet Teacher. Um, but probably the Drake. Either minion is going to get traded out by that Lotheb in terms of uh, what he puts on the board. So might as well play the Drake to dig through his deck for those preparations and weapon buffs that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Still no prep inside. That's um that's a problem. You can't really utilize your dagger as well. And I'm sure that Gara will have to remove both of those Azur Drakes. You can't really leave double spell power on board. A single blade flurry deals free damage then, and that I don't even want to talk about Fen of Nice, which cycles too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was a coil over on the left hand side, picks it up here, allows him to uh coil down the Azure Drake. Um, but he's still staring at that second Drake on the board, so he might have to send that 5 damage from the Lotheb into it here. Doesn't have a, a better option to trade. None of the tempo cards like uh, Abusive Sergeant or Power Overwhelming presented themselves to him. So it looks like we're going to have to respect that Azure Drake here, sight unseen of the other Rogue's hand. I mean, if he could see the other Rogue's hand, he might consider just going face. Because um, there's no there's no Eviscerates, there's no like big weapon buff for the Blade Flurry, but... 
Uh, he has to respect the possibility of those cards being there, so I definitely agree with the trade this turn. That was a fan of knives. The kills loaded. Hmm. Uh, now let's count. You can sap the M gang boss. Yeah. And then use the fan of knives. Kill the footman. <sighs> but you can't play the Advent Van Cleft that turn. You can play Violet Teacher, sap the ink bo gang boss, but you can't kill the low tap that turn. So that's also awkward. You're always one, one mana off something you can go for the violet the, uh, what about what about fan of knives blade flurry edwin Van? no that's also oh, yeah you know. if you want to make the edwin play the only thing you can really do is sap the in gang boss blade flurry to kill the five one and then play a six six van cleef that's like the only thing that works to make a tempo play with the van cleef that turn um, but uh, JJ obviously feels that that isn't good enough, and he's just gonna make it make the best consolidated play he can. He does have kind of a an, an awkward board here to deal with, but he is forced to fan of knives to generate that extra imp from the imp gang boss, which is less than perfect. Um, hmm. Now it seems like you want to um, play around AOEs. So you don't, you're not taunting up the egg. You're not taunting up the hunted creeper that you have in your hand. If you want to play the defense of Argus, the same case is probably with the new M gang boss. If you want to play it and be on curve. So, but at the same time, we would like to remove the Violet Teacher because it presents so much value. Right. The, yeah, the positioning with the Argus here is a little bit awkward. Not really through any fault of Gara's. It's not like he's mispositioned his minions. It's just kind of worked out in that sort of situation where just organically the, the buffs don't really work out too well. But he is going to get the Argus down on the double uh, Imgang boss, trade into the Violet Teacher. And as you said, the important thing here is that he's leaving the egg behind the Taunt Wall so that it can't be popped preemptively before a Blade Flurry comes down. So. Yeah, the sub punishes the taunted up M gang boss. And the Edwin Van Clef is finally hitting the board as a 6 6 minion. So that's a huge problem for Gara. It certainly is. If there's an owl in his deck, this is the time he's going to want to draw it. That or a power overwhelming would be his ideal draws this turn. Knife Juggler really isn't going to get the job done. Void Caller, neither. Really. Decent value with the M gang boss in his hand, but it's too slow to address the situation that he has in front of him right now. Huh. So, I guess we have to ignore this 6-6 six, six for now and just make the best play despite it. Um, which this is the turn when you actually probably have to kill the 3-3. Free free. Because you so. most likely will lose, lose your board. And you don't, want, you don't want to give your opponent a chance to pop the egg before the clears. Because that will happen with the, uh, with the agent, most likely. Yeah. Uh, and otherwise, your opponent will have to, to use the dagger, so he will lose two mana in, in the process. Yeah, I like this. Just goes with the two stickiest minions possible. It sets up um, maximum potential for his knife juggler on the following turn. And it's also just creating the fear in his opponent from, from that void caller, but not knowing what's going to come out of it. But we do see that JJ has the second sap in hand. So even if Doomguard or Malganis were to come out, he's going to be ready to deal with it. And he's, in fact, just going to choose to sap away the. Uh, the boy caller sight unseen, just send it back to the hand, which is totally viable as well. Let's him go to face with the uh, Edwin Van Cleef and start mm -hmm. putting on the pressure. And I really like that this sap is so valuable when you have some board presence at the same time. The Acidic Swamp boost, we forgot about it, right? We did. I wasn't sure it was in Gara's deck, actually. Did we Did you, Did you? we see this against Orange? Someone Mexico? was using it. Someone was using uh, the... Yeah, AK, AK, but it was Eco, uh, right? AK Wonder had it in his deck. And Eco had it in his Reno Jackson. Yes, that's right. I but I'm not like, sure like, if Gara did have it. Have I feel it. like we saw so many games of uh, this deck against Orange yesterday that we should have seen the Acidic Swamp Poos, but I don't actually remember it happening. But it might be just like our minds playing trick on, tricks on us. We're so focused on remembering the Kezan Mystic, right? That we yeah. just kind of <laughs> forgot about the other tech cards. So. 
Um, how would we want to deal with this situation? Uh, there is 11, 12 damage facing him down on the board here, so he is in trouble if he doesn't make a defensive Doomguard play here, but we can see from JJ's hand that there isn't there isn't enough damage in hand to finish the game here, but he does have the sprints to pick up that sort of pressure over the next couple of turns. Um, but he's going to reload the Void Caller here, and now with both saps gone, he knows that this Void Caller will now get value at some point. No silence in the Rogue deck to play around, but that heal bot is a really nice draw if he doesn't want to just go ahead and sprint this turn just to give him the, the longevity that he needs to end the game. Mm -hmm. Three, five, it's the best, six, it's the best play, I completely agree with you. And 11, 12. If you, there's still two preparations in the deck, right? So yes. if you go for the sprint into prep oil, you win the game. <laughs> That's very true, actually, yeah. Um, yeah, just about anything he draws is playable, and a Deadly Poison or a... Um... Wait, wait, it's actually 18, so it's two of lethal. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because he only has one weapon charge up. Yes, yeah, right. yeah. yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, the Sprint has a not a particularly high percentage chance of drawing lethal in that case then. So yeah, I kind of like the heal bot just for the longevity, and I imagine this is just going 12 to face this turn. No, he is going to trade into the Imp Gang boss, okay. Respecting some of the damage potential from his opponent here. So he's uh, going for the for the sprint next turn, and he's aware that he will have 11 mana that turn. Yeah, and I, I guess the thinking behind trading into the Imp Gang boss there is that it, if a Malganis is summoned from this uh, Void Caller, he doesn't want any additional demons to be on the board and um, to potentially be buffed up, especially since he can just play Malganis from his hand if he would want to, which would create you know two huge buffs on the board. So. Mm-hmm. Agreeing. Seems like Gara will now be using Hunted Creepers as potential damage. Damage? Wow, he's not playing a, around IOE anymore. Yeah, I think he's uh, realized that he has to take the risks now, and he's just going to try and maximize his amount of knives. He can get the knife from the Doomguard summon, he can get the knife from the Nerubian summon, he can get two knives from the Hornet Creeper being popped, so it's actually a pretty high board all clear potential, all things considered, but the first two knives both hit face! Yep. And a PO! Wait, what? Five, six, eight, twelve, no. So, Doomguard into the 3-3, three, three, and he's gonna try and clear up the rest here. May have to use the Power Overwhelming to guarantee this. Yeah, he is gonna use the PO here. And I think the best way to do this now is just to guarantee the knives to face? Okay. Did you attack with the egg? Wait. He did, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, literally every single knife hit face. <laughs> Assassin's Good. Blade. How much damage is that? Uh, Three. Oh. Six. <laughs> I was just kind of. Does it? Does it clear the board? But it doesn't. But it's still kind of okay. So you sprint first, right? Um. Because you will use one blade flurry to kill the one one. The, the one HP minions. Yeah. You might also get back steps. Oh, he goes oh, for the assassin. He gets the double clear with the blade flurry, yeah. So assassin's blade hit face and then flurry again is in fact a ball clear. This is really good. Actually puts the puts the warlock down to five as well, I believe. Yeah, five. So he's just um, under threat of um, sprint into eviscerate. Coin hero power is now lethal as well. Wow, that was a really good play. And he plays around a coin, uh, a coin. A against acidic swampus too. Yeah. <laughs> Very true, and there you go, there's the use. Well played, JJ. And Doomguard is going to come down here for pressure, but with these two sprints in hand, obviously he's only going to cast one of them, but the sprint is just so likely to pick up lethal here. Doesn't even need it. Deadly Poison comes off the top. Yep, and that's it. JJ takes the lead 2-0 against Gara. Hmm, that, I mean, this match was a back and forth so much. It really was, yeah. I really love the way how, how JG played the last turn with the Assassin's Blade. To be honest, that wasn't something I was thinking about in the first place, right. but it made so much sense after seeing it. Yeah, it's something that you quite often have to do in Desperation, like the double blade flurry, um, just using two of your hero power daggers, but mm -hmm. um, not a play I've seen too often using the Assassin's Blade as well. I was like looking at the Assassin's Blade and hitting something and then maybe using two blade flurries with the the weapon and the thing. But yeah, um, JJ found a much cleaner way of, of doing it and did it very quickly. And it also just had the added bonus of setting up lethal really, really nicely for the following turn. 
And that lets him go out to a 2-0 lead here against no. Gara, who's going to have to try and fight his way back from behind again with this Zoo deck, but this time there's no Kezan Mystic to help him. Well, there's the Ooze, but it proved to be useless. Right, Last also, time. yeah, just point this out. We've seen... Um, Maybe he's playing two Zoo right, exactly. with different techs against different exactly. uh, type of decks, right? We haven't seen the Kezan drawn in this set at all, but we have seen the Acidic Swampoos, which we're thinking we didn't see yesterday. So it seems like Gara, on, in that case, is just carrying two different Zoo decks, one teched out against secret classes and one teched out against weapon classes. Hmm. Okay. Interesting stuff. Well, we'll publish the, the deck list on this site, on uh, d2esports.com, after the tournament with some information and statistics. So we'll definitely have the full information after the, under, after the tournament to see what exactly were the differences and the thought process for picking the decks. Pretty interested to see that. Yeah, I'd love to see that as well. There's definitely, uh, anytime there's a new twist on a tournament format like this, there's always the, the most interesting part is a part that you don't get to see, which is um, where all the players get together beforehand and you know try and discuss what the optimal strategies and stuff are. It's one of the parts I really liked about the uh, Red Bull tournament, right? That that process was mm -hmm. actually live and on camera and they were mic'd up as well at the same time. So yeah, really that was a super see, interesting. Yeah, you got to see like the whole process through from start to finish. It's kind of cool. <laughs> And the, well, the the board is built. Yep. Jader has a wide. Well, he has a lot of options. He just missing. He's just missing the backstab to be to have a perfect hand, in my opinion. Yeah, he definitely has a, a multitude of answers in his hand right now, but none of those answers really interact too well with this board. He could do like. Um, Blood Mage coin eviscerate on the Imp Gang boss, but that's awful. You just get your Blood Mage traded out straight away. You can't get to the 1 1 with your dagger. Um, so there's nothing looking too appealing right now. And the Defender of Argus next turn from, from Gara is going to put on a ton of pressure. Hmm. Is it just going to dagger pass? It's just going to dagger pass. All right. Like I said, nothing seemed to line up very well, so his options were just playing a 3-3 minion on the board and or just that turn that we see there, which is passing, and Gara is going to take that opportunity to consolidate his Defender of Argus, and that is a ton of pressure coming in already, already down to 22 life as the road. I was just thinking that he would develop the agent on turn 3, just as a 3-3 minion, you know? Because mm. now he's pushed to use the Falnos and Eviscerate. If you would go for the um, agent, then you have a way of clearing the 1 HP minions with the Fan of Knives. Sure. And still not, this uh, you will not destroy the egg. Alright, so he can Sea Giant this turn. If he wants to play an Abusive Sergeant, he can essentially do that for free. Any 1 mana minion you can play, you can always play with, with Sea Giant. Um, so... He's going to have to decide here whether he wants to go all out pressure. And I kind of like getting the, the Abusive Sergeant into play a little bit as well, just to really max out on the pressure. Because if you go all in here and your opponent doesn't have the sap, you're kind of just ending the game, right? Like, does this threaten lethal on next turn? 8, 9, 10, 12, 13? It does not. So if he was at 16, you'd have had two damage on board. You still would have been one off. So, all right, I guess it doesn't actually change the clock unless you top deck something relevant. And no Blade Flurry again for yep. JJ this time. No Blade Flurry, no Sap to deal with the Sea Giant. So that is eight damage that is hitting him in the face this turn. And Lord Low there. Tab will seal the deal. Yeah, and this time the Abusive Sergeant is going to come down for pressure. Uh, he's even going to trade into the board, which I can't disagree with at all this turn because it just yes. puts so much power on the board. It is about it. And that is going to be game one game coming back for Gara here. Uh, the Antique Hillbot does not even keep him alive, right? Nope. Yeah, so well, that just, just denies the attack from the Sea Giant for yeah. one turn, and that's yeah. about it. Exactly. Um, okay, so Gara takes the uh, third game for... Um, well, still not an easy, easy... He doesn't have an easy way of making a comeback because he's playing the same match up five times in a row yep. and it's between rogue and in a zoo when rogue has such a wide uh, variety of um such a such a arsenal of aoe clears 
and saps for the minions that have death rattles, right? So he it's unfavorable. He's in a unfavorable position right now. Yeah, for sure. And these these opening hand minions are not really the ones you want. They're just a little bit too vulnerable to the deadly poisons and the backstabs. And yeah, it's not often you'll see a zoo just mulligan away all their knife jugglers. But against Rogue, you really do want that sticky stuff early to start building the board, create a platform for your uh, your defender of Argus and your sea giant, like we saw in the previous game. Um, and yeah, that was a that was a pretty straightforward game for Gara last time because of he did get that strong sticky start into his aggressive stuff later on. Oh. This time, Super DJ doesn't have any minions in the opening hand, which might be problematic. It might be, yeah. Well, there's the backstab on the spider if JJ wants to. I was oh just my about to say, god! He picks up the oh Van my Cleef. god! If he picks up the Van Cleef, this is insane. Backstab on the creeper, prep fad of knives, Van Cleef. Like... Wait, wait, isn't it better to deadly poison this turn and just kill the Voidwalker? Deadly poison this turn. Uh, I don't know. I kind of want... Is he going to sap instead? He's sapping, backstabbing, killing, and playing Edwin. Uh, sap, backstab, kill... Right! Oh, yeah, yeah, this is much better. Okay, sure. So I was I was thinking that you backstab Fan of Knives, the Creeper, and then you dagger up Deadly Poison to clear out the Taunt next turn, but this plays around any ridiculousness, like uh, Power Overwhelming plus Abusive Sergeant, something like that, to like deal damage into your Edwin. Mm -hmm. Having it win against an empty board is much better, so yeah. I, I like this line from, from JJ for sure. So, it's um, hand lock in a different form. Turn free giant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a turn sooner than even hand lock can do it, so... The Edwin Van Cleef will pressure Gara really a lot. So Gara will be practically forced to use implosion this turn or just drop the void walker and haunted creeper so he can use the double abusive surgeon next turn yeah. but well turn four can be implosion and abusive surgeon so this is not bad at all and now jj will be of course using the poison to get the taunt out of the way and just deal eight damage to the face yeah and this means there's no possible answer from gara's hand again uh implosion, implosion plus abusive sergeant can only do a maximum of seven here so mm -hmm. Oh dear, this has uh -oh. uh, gone badly. Yep, and how much damage was in? Four! Does get the four, but doesn't really matter. This is just going to get Fan of Knives off the board again, oh and he's going to take another eight. So if you play the, if you play the Abusive Surgeon right now, you're getting punished so much. But if you're not doing it, and you only deal one damage to the Edwin Van Cleef, then how do you kill it next turn? Right. With the, with the Doom card? So <laughs> Because if you deal free damage to it right now, then you have a paddler into a charge minion, into a, uh, into a um, elven archer, mortal coil. Oh, JJ, JJ's going to one hundred percent play the top deck here. One hundred percent. We had this discussion yesterday about yeah. whether it's right to play the card, but in that situation, I am all I, I am all in for playing the top deck. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> There's the paddler. Look at that. Yep. If he will... Ah, uh, no, nah, he's going for the Doomguard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Doomguard to trade into a minion that's already hit Ooh. you for 16. And oh. as a Drake off the top is perfect. Tomb Pillager for next turn now as well. And you it's... can combo out that with the Eviscerate or the Blade Throw to hit for 2 damage. Yep. While Gunners doesn't do... Well, basically dead card. So, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. And this is uh, very similar to that last deciding game in the Life Coach series that we watched, right? Where suddenly there was just a sequence of turns that kind of went insane. And he just drew perfect cards that he needed every turn. Yeah. Did we even see the discovery choices? Because I would only saw Corruption. Yeah, he just mashed Corruption. I guess Soulfire was the only thing he would have taken over a Corruption there. But wow, this is uh, getting crazy. And that is just lethal, yeah. Two damage Blade Flurry, five damage of this is gonna seal the game. Well, JJ is our last semi-finalist. Yes, JJ is joining the three other players in the semi-finals. So we have Zetalot, we have uh, Life Coach, uh, sorry, but Zetalot is playing against uh, Crane, and Life Coach is playing against Super JJ. Yeah, and the classes that we're gonna see is Zetalot on Priest versus Crane on Warrior. And uh, life coach on druid versus super JJ on rogue. So. Exactly, four different classes. Yep. 
so that's very cool to see and a one class tournament and um well that was that was the fastest match today right sure. I, I think every, every other series has gone three two i believe apart from that one so, i think so yeah well you can also draw some conclusions from um, by watching a one matchup a few times over right how the matchup usually play, uh, plays out and uh I think it's very interesting to watch those um, those matches because that's something that you, you usually don't see in a competitive environment, in a competitive Hearthstone environment. Um, but uh, right now we'll be jumping into a break for a few minutes. Hopefully the players will be ready as soon as possible. I know that Zedalot is watching the games, gathering the information, <laughs> and it's kind of important because Crane has a secret weapon that he used today, had a secret weapon that he used today against Ecop, and he pulled off beautiful games. So we'll be jumping to a short break. Don't go anywhere. Next match is between Zetalot and Crane. This is G2 Esports Class Legends. We'll be right back. <laughs> 